So I'm looking here at Avalanche Presses, Granada, the Fall of Mother of Spain. Um, read through the rules a while ago and then started them up again. It's, uh, they're a painful job. Um, they're readable in terms of seem very clear and everything, but then you start finding these inconsistencies or missing points or worse, where it actually looks like they just made a mistake somewhere. So, going to have to kind of play faking the rules, which I'm good at doing anyhow. Let me try to explain uh, the game a little bit. The components are pleasing in a sense. There's a very glossy aspect to everything, which I find kind of disturbing. Probably, yeah, there you're catching some of it <laughs> off the video. Uh, you know, I, I don't like that high a gloss. But otherwise, you've got a very sturdy map. You've got these kind of nice uh, player aid cards. Counters are really thick with very little information on them. And then you have this. This little sheet of paper with most of the tables you need in the game. And it is just a sheet of paper. Back printed so that... You can't have everything you need in one place. Pain in the butt. You also have two ten-sided dice. At least that's what came with mine. And this is a game that utilizes buckets of dice. You kind of wish they'd give you more. Uh, I know most of us, and I certainly don't have this problem, most of us have tons and tons of dice. But ten-siders, although they've become more and more common in war games, Still, I don't think the assumption should be that everybody has a significant quantity of them. Six-siders, hey, I don't mind if you only give me four or six of them in a buckets of dice game. But I'm not even seeing that. I'm seeing two. Eh? <laughs> All right. Set up. It's up to the players. Uh, basically, you have Muslim Granada down here. And the Muslims are allowed to set up anywhere within there. And then you have... Uh, the rest of Spain, and the Spanish are allowed to set up anywhere there, including what looks like kind of a scary place to be, so I didn't want to go there. Uh, counters include different kinds of infantry, uh, cavalry, knight, these are the knightly orders, some ships, siege cannons, and for the Ottoman similar, or for the uh, Muslim similar, here's some Ottoman infantry, I believe these are Ottoman navies. All right. Uh, you have this little turn track up here. It keeps track of the years and also the season that you're in. Uh, just how deep into the season you are, basically. You have a bunch of control markers to mark locations that you've taken from the opponent. They're back printed with the Muslim symbol as well. The object of the game, well, for the Spaniards, if they can win, uh, well, they can win by taking all Moorish three and four strength castles within Spanish or within Granada itself. And for the Moors, they win if they own Cordoba and Lorca at the beginning of a turn. If both sides achieve their victory at once, you should look at each other stupidly, but uh, you just keep playing until only one side has won in that case. That's for an immediate victory. On the other hand, the game ends at the end of 1492, the last season there, which may or may not be the 10th one. There's a randomness factor to this. And at that point, uh, the Spaniards win if they control... Uh, Granada itself here and all the ports so long as they do that it's viewed that they will win otherwise they lose alright uh, sequence of play is well the first thing you determine in a particular campaign is did somebody win the next thing you do is you can decide to roll campaigns and this is kind of a cute idea, in my view. Uh, 
I have to find it. <laughs> the command table. Each player can roll on the command table if they wish. Or uh, they can activate one leader or a single unit alone. So in the Spanish turn, they have this option. Do you want to activate something or do you want to roll here? Well, the advantage to rolling here is you might get four activations. The disadvantage is you might get none. Or worse, the opponent might get activations, in which case you keep you roll again after the opponent takes their activations. Those opponent activations aren't very clearly explained here as to whether or not they can fight battles within them. Uh, I think I'm going to play it as if they're whole little Moorish turns that happen inside, or... Spanish turns that happen inside a Moorish turn in, on, the, on the converse. Um, okay, so then you get, normally you will not be giving the other player actions. So trying to figure out what should be done in that case, and I'll pour over the rules a little more to make sure I, that I haven't missed something. Um, you get to activate your units and move them. And as far as I see, Battle doesn't happen at this point. In fact, it very clearly doesn't happen at this point. Which is why I think that maybe the activations should just be activations chances for the Moors to move. I am pretty sure that's the case. That you wouldn't get a whole battle sequence, etc. So, uh, movement. Well, there's two types of lines on the board. I don't know how easily distinguishable there are. There's darker ones and lighter ones. The darker ones cost a half movement point each to move along. The lighter ones cost a full movement point. And you've got movement allowances set here, no biggie there. Uh, and a force moves as slow as its slowest unit, no big shock. Okay, so then uh, after movement, if the opposing player had any of his commands in reserve, he has the chance to move them now. Now one of the things you do when you activate a force is you can set one of the leaders or some of the leaders, whatever, into a reserve status. When you define a force in this game, as far as I can tell, but it's not terribly clear, whoever the lead, whoever the most uh, high-ranking leader, and rank is, of course, the highest is the lowest, uh, a leader has three numbers on him, first number is his attack, the last number is his defense, the middle number is his command rating. That's how many forces he can activate. He can also activate any other leaders that are under him. But those leaders have their own command ratings. That doesn't seem to come into play. There's no, no command hierarchy type rule in this that I, can under, that I can perceive. So if you activate Ferdinand, you get at most eight troops stacked with him you could shift things around in his stack, though, if there was another leader there commanding other units. Um, one of the options you have when you activate a leader is instead of moving him, you can put him in reserve, or you can put a portion of his force in reserve. It looks like you can actually just put individual units in reserve. That doesn't make sense to me. There are other things that don't make sense in this. Um, okay. And... Uh, then your opponent gets to move their reserves, which could end up changing the the uh, odds in a battle, as it were. Then you get to fight combat, and if it's a land battle, if two people, uh, if opposing sides are facing each other in a space that doesn't have a castle, or uh, the defender's not in a castle, then they must fight. If the defender's taken refuge in a castle, the attacker can just walk by if they wish. On the other hand, they could stay there and they could attack the castle. And that has multiple uh, multiple stages in it, one of which starts with being trying to blow the walls down. Uh, but it's handled sort of like a battle. It's just a little modified. And then there's also the option of sea battles if two players are in the same sea zone. Looks to me like... Uh, that only happens on an interception, which is okay. Uh, okay, and then the Moor has almost the same situation. He has one difference. If pure Moorish cavalry, or if a force with Moorish cavalry attacks inside Granada, uh, 
inside the lines of Granada, it has a special surprise step where it has a chance to, be, to surprise its opponent. Okay. Uh, let's jump over to the battle rules because that's kind of, I think, the meat of this game. Um, so, and here, here's where one of the, and, and this is why I want to drop the rules and, and modify them myself. There's a serious issue in this. Okay, so if there's a battle, basically you lo throw your troops out on the, on the table. On the first round, in general, the defender is the only person who rolls. And they roll dice for each of their units. Those units can be modified by leaders. Leaders can modify the strength of a unit or of units by an amount equal to their attack or defense number, depending on which position they're in. But that's a total amount. So, for example, Ferdinand has plus four. He can add plus four to some of his units, divide it up as he likes. So it could be plus four to all one unit. The proviso there is no unit can be a greater strength than seven. And the goal here is to roll uh, less than or equal to your strength. Zeros in this game are tens. Just always, you know, every, every game has to specify, oh, yeah, we... We mean zeros to be zeros, or we mean zeros to be tens, which is great and all. It just seems like there have been dice that have been made with tens on them. If I, if I made zeros tens, I would actually have them written on my dice. Yeah, 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 I'm grumpy. Okay. Um, so then what do you do? Well, on the first round, like I said, combat's not simultaneous. The defender rolls first. He rolls his dice, and th the number of hits he obtains, the number of successful rolls, are then applied to the attacker. Now, here's where these rules get really, really weird. They say you can apply them all to one unit. And this is a step-loss game. It's very clear that when one unit takes one loss, it's flipped over. When it takes a second loss, it's gone. Well, if I can apply more than two losses to a unit, I'm sure going to do that, right? And they make it sound like it's this kind of option. I think it's a, an error in the rules, and I think there are quite a few little places that are kind of like this. But reading that one convinced me I cannot trust these rules at all. I'm going to have to make my own exceptions. I'm sure there's a rata somewhere online. I'm not too worried about that. I think I can fake a pretty good game out of it. Well, I think I can get the rules that they intend more or less out of it. Okay, uh, so then the attacker gets to counterattack with what's left, but then in each succeeding round, and both players have an option to retreat, in each succeeding round, the combat's considered simultaneous, which is even more annoying in buckets of dice games, but we'll leave that alone. Okay, uh, base strength adjustment is, well, it's from the leaders. Uh, is there anything else? Not really. Okay. Bunch of rules on how to retreat. Uh, the surprise attacks I was talking about, if the Moorish Cav attack, well, if they get their surprise, they're the only things that attack in the first round of combat. And then it goes to simultaneous. What that means is not only do they take away the defender advantage, but they also get their own little advantage, which is cool. Uh... There's overruns, five or more units running into one that's not in a castle. They just destroy it, I guess. Uh, okay, castles are kind of interesting as well. First of all, unoccupied castles have a garrison strength in them, as do occupied ones. And that's a number of... Yeah, that's a single hit unit with that strength. So if you attack the castle, with that, it, it gets a roll against you at that strength. More than one, actually, because if you're defending in a castle, um, first of all, units that are defending in the castle, if it's a three or four strength castle, get one or two added to the, all their strengths, which is cool. What else do they get? Well, um, as long as the walls aren't breached, they get to roll twice in each round of combat. And also in the first round, they get the defensive bonus. So even hitting an unoccupied castle may not be absolutely trivial. There are siege guns, 
which can be used, and there's sort of a siege gun table here, um, and you count up the number of guns you have against the castle strength, and you have to make a certain roll, uh, and if you get that roller higher, you've breached the walls, and that takes away the double shooting effect. Siege guns can only be used attacking or defending in a castle. They have their own strength as well, which I guess gets used uh, as uh, along with whatever uh, effect they have on the walls. And in that way, they can be used as a defensive thing. Uh, I should ignore the naval rules because boats are boring, right? It's my general uh, habit to ignore naval rules. They're a little weird here. It looks like... The only way to generate combat in a naval action is if somebody's trying to move through you in a sea zone, and then you can intercept and you roll a die and add the number of ships being intercepted, and if you get a nine or more, you succeed, and then you have to fight. I don't see any other. Thing that claims it creates naval battle. Uh, so I can't just sail in and attack your ships. I can only generate a naval battle by intercepting, from what I understand. Which may be okay. Uh, because if they end up blockading, I can try to attack them in order to move in or out. I can't not... I can't they can't avoid me. They're blockading, so they must fight. Uh, the Moor is allowed to transport units if he has ships. Now, this is also kind of a wanky rule in terms of how it's written. Maybe they move all in stacks. I'm not sure. But it's very, very hard to understand. But basically, I can move from port to port as long as there are ships capable of transporting me, and I guess they move with me, and I can't transport through a sea area if there are, uh, what is it, more? Uh, my eyes aren't working very well right now. At least one of them isn't. Uh, at least as many Ottoman ships present going through that sea area, or already there, or something. And even if there are, I can still be intercepted, I assume. I'm not sure what happens if I'm not moving all those one stack. That's not terribly clear. I assume they all get in the fight. Okay, so what's kind of cool, though, is at the end of each turn, there's a roll to see if that's the last... Well, at the end of each season, seasonal turn... There's a roll to see if that's the last turn of the year. And eventually, the year will end, and you go to a winter interface. But there's something really neat here, which is if there's a major victory, uh, which requires there to be at least a leader and at least four units, one of which must be an infantry, on if each side has that. Uh, then there's a chance that there's a major victory. Now, what's that chance? Well, if at the end of a round of combat, the other player retreats, calls off an attack. So, to me, it seems like there's going to be a major victory. It's not a chance. There's no roll. There's, there's no, nothing that modifies it. Um... Except that the winning player has to still be present. They can't wipe each other out. But as long as one side's there, there's a major victory. And what happens when you win a major victory is you get to shift the season marker. Um, two boxes in a direction of your choice. Now, the Moors generally want to slow things down, so they will try to advance the season marker to prevent there from being as many turns, whereas the Spaniards probably want more time to do whatever they have to do. But it may be different. There may be a balance of power issue where, you know, the Moors can get a lot done and they want to extend that season. Okay, 
In the winter lull, uh, first, both players have to withdraw from any uh, castles that they're besieging. And they can also withdraw from other spaces. And uh, Then you count the number of Moorish castles controlled by the Spanish player. And subtract two for each Spanish castle point controlled by the Moorish player. Okay, so Spanish castles caught count double, and you roll somewhere. Damned if I know where. Uh, one thing you roll on is the campaign season chart to determine how far down uh, how many campaign turns there are going to be, essentially. Uh, with the box starting uh, closer being less turns. Um, you also roll for different uh, reinforcements at these different levels uh, against these different types of forces. So for example, the Spanish have to roll against infantry, artillery, cavalry, etc. Now they have these extra three-point infantry and four-point infantry, and I'm not sure what the difference between those is, but they start off with lots of three-point infantry, so I'm guessing they get better troops from the reinforcements for some reason. It's not like the difference between the uh, Moorish and the Ottoman. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, for the Ottoman Empire forces, those can only happen in 1486 or later, and if you get a result, that's the only time you roll. But if you don't get a result, you get to keep rolling until you get one. And again, there's die roll modifiers here uh, to what you're going to get based on the number of castles, uh, castle points controlled, which is the same as this factor, I guess. Um, some placement restrictions on them. So for example, the Moorish Cav can only show up where there's horses. The Catholics have restrictions based on their different knightly orders, etc. Uh, and then there's a set of special rules, uh, just a handful of them. Amir Ali, who's the leader, uh, starting in 1484, he gets to see if he dies. <laughs> uh, his son, Bobadil, starting in 1482, can't stack with other leaders except one Ali al-Attar, who I think is here, and he'll attack other leaders. Now, oddly enough, his father's death doesn't help this as far as I see. And then the Spanish knightly orders don't work well together. They can't command each other's troops. That's about it. I don't have a lot of hope for this. Uh, you know, it's, somebody spent a lot of money on components building it, but uh, it just doesn't seem like there's a lot of game here and, and a lot of really detailed historical aspects. It seems like a very, very light game uh, on the borderline of what may or may not be a war game. And it doesn't look to me like it has a terribly interesting set of decisions to be made. Uh, so I'm not sure who this is going to appeal to. But what the hell, I paid my money for it, I might as well play it.